on behalf of the Research Center for German and Austrian Exile Studies, closely associated with the Institute of Modern Languages Research at the University of London, greetings and a very warm welcome to this evening's seminar titled Writing Home, Heimat and Belonging in the Work of Four German-Speaking Women, Writers Exiled to Britain from 1933 which is being recorded. There will be an opportunity for questions and answers afterwards. It is my very great pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Angerad Mountford, whom I first knew as a research student at the IMLR. Happily, she has recently completed her PhD exploring German-speaking women writers in exile and their presentation of home and belonging. Prior to this, her studies included an MA in Anglo-German Cultural Relations at Queen Mary University of London, building on it a BA in Comparative Literature with a focus on German. I'm very pleased to say that Angad is also now a fellow committee member of this research centre. And I look forward now very much to hearing as I'm sure you all do, to her presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Jana, and uh, welcome everyone to my seminar. Uh, this presentation aims to showcase my PhD research. Um, it will be a bit of a lightning talk, because I've only got half an hour, so I can't go into as much detail as I probably would have liked to, um, but I hope that it will inspire some interesting discussion. I've got a presentation which I will share. So I'll quickly just explain how this short presentation will be structured. Firstly, I will consider two key questions, why I looked at women and why these women in particular. I'll briefly introduce the four women writers I studied before looking at Heimat and belonging, the concepts of which are key to understanding my approach. Following this, I will give a short overview of each of the four women, sharing extracts of their writing and the way in which they presented home and belonging through their work. Finally, I will summarize the conclusions I came to in my research and open the floor to questions and comments. Whilst in recent decades, German and Austrian exile studies has become a more popular and researched field, there are still significant gaps in knowledge that remain to be filled. One of the areas which invites additional research is German speaking women writers who were exiled in Britain from 1933. Historically, those exiled German writers who were male have received much more scholarly attention than their female counterparts. As Sonja Hiltzinger, writing on the subject of German Jewish writers in exile, states, all too often the silence imposed by exile turned into permanent neglect. In light of this oversight and underrepresentation, my research aims to shed light on some of the lesser known German speaking women writers who were exiled in Britain. My research considers the life and work of Gerda Meyer, Gabriella Tirgit, Ruth Feiner, and Ava Priester, focusing on the issues of home, heimat, and belonging as represented both in the writer's literary output, but also in their private and personal lives whilst in exile. So why women? As previously mentioned, traditionally, male exile writers have received much more attention. But the decision to focus on women is more than just about making sure these women writers are known, which of course is important in its own right. With regard to the study of gender in early exile studies, it was the predominantly male elite that formed the subject of the so-called first wave of exile studies. Reflecting on the previous overlooking of the women exiles and especially exiled women writers, Dagmar Lorenz explains that the male experience was implicitly treated as the norm, as too were the literary styles and messages of male authors. In contrast, women were traditionally seen to write for the purpose of self-therapy or emancipation, rather than the self-historicization or epochal awareness. Seldom were they attributed with agency or independence. As a result of this belief, men's memoirs of the exilic situation were deemed more important. Whereas the majority of memoirs, biographies, and autobiographies concerning male exiles predominantly focused on professional and public experiences, 
It was only examinations of the lives of women that began to provide detailed insight into daily life and the everyday challenges of exile. Writing by women in exile can therefore play a central role in our overall understanding of life in exile, and thus must be treated not only as equally as important as texts by male writers, but also as texts which may provide a very different perspective of the exile experience. Writing as a profession was no easy feat for exiles. Arguably, women writers in exile experienced more difficulty in making a living from their trade than male writers. As it was generally easier for women to get paid employment, such as domestic labor or other menial labor, it was often the females who would have to earn money for the family, which consequently left little time for pastimes like writing. In contrast, many male writers had the time to put pen to paper. This scenario can be seen in the experience of Julia Kerr. Her husband, Alfred, famous as a critic back home in Germany, yet unemployed in England, was able to continue with his writing, although this brought in little money in exile. Julia, his wife, was unable to keep up her musical ambitions due to her secretarial workload and attempts to earn enough money to keep the family going. But why look at these women? Gerda Meyer, Gabriella Tirgit, Ruth Feiner, and Ava Priester can all be seen as exceptions to the norm, not only in terms of their occupations as writers, as the majority of female exiles were in, at this time in domestic service, but also in the way in which they wrote. Notably, the four women writers do not write about specifically female issues, yet choose to focus on the more universal and often political subjects, such as exile life, government policy, history, and national belonging. Rather than centering on the female experience and perhaps discussing more gender-specific concerns, the women's writing demonstrates a certain amount of gender neutrality, as well as activism, and presents the writers as independent women who were not defined by their gender. My research does not choose to focus on women writers because of the female angle with which they wrote, but rather precisely because they chose not to do this. These writers should thus be described as exile writers rather than women exile writers, seen on an equal footing to male exile writers, and their work viewed as equally valuable, articulate, and important in our understanding of the exile experience. Despite all being German speaking, only two of the writers considered were German, the others having grown up in Russia and Czechoslovakia, although Ava Priester, having grown up in Russia, saw herself as Austrian. All four of the women writers came from different places at different ages and wrote in different genres, languages, about different subjects. My choice of these four women then is due to their differences that invite comparison. In comparing poetry, journalism, essays, and novels written in both German and English, I hope to gain a broader and more detailed understanding of the various approaches these writers chose to take in representing themes of home and belonging. In exile, the women considered in my research, whether nostalgically maintaining attachment to a home tied to their childhood memories or forging roots in a new social group, all had varying relationships to the idea of belonging. On the subject of belonging, Linda Short claims that as a grounded and pra practiced connectedness which anchors the self in a changing world, belonging is an elastic term that encompasses ideas of being at ease with one's physical and social environment. This sense of belonging can range from anchorage in a physical or imagined place, group, cultural practice or tradition, and even spans to include more abstract groundings in a remembered or prospective time and space. In the German speaking world, the concept of Heimat represents a very specific sense of belonging and home, the idealized notion of the German homeland. This Heimat, according to Peter Blickler, who has written a comprehensive study on the subject, is only acknowledged upon leaving it. Thus, the migration to another country serves to strengthen feelings of attachment to an individual's former home. Early ideas of Heimat were deeply rooted in geography, tied to a singular fixed location, usually the place of birth. The concept became synonymous with depictions of nature, often an imagined idyll at odds with the real ge geographical place. Being traditionally a concept written about by men and seen in a patriarchal light, the traditional idea of Heimat is a highly gendered one. 
Concepts of Heimat and memories which form individuals' perceptions of it often hark back to childhood, a time when the mother was a crucial part of identity formation. In traditional views perpetuated in the patriarchal society, the mother represents a constant reassuring presence in opposition to the wandering and nomadic man. Family and women were symbols of stability. This has, however, been challenged more recently by female scholars who view the concept of Heimat more critically and who seek to balance the former gender bias, putting forward ideas of a more feminist, fluid and movable place of belonging. Given the complex relationship that Heimat has with gender, it is an interesting concept to reflect upon in my research about women writers. So now we've covered the rationale behind the choice of women and the theories and concepts which will be used. Well, now we want some examples of each of the women's writing, starting with Gerda Meyer. Gerda Meyer Nie Stein was born in 1927 to a German speaking Jewish family in Karlsbad, a spa town west of Prague. Like many German speaking children who came to Britain in the late 1930s, Meyer was able to reach safety thanks to the operations of the kinder transport. In contrast to the other three women, Gerda Meyer is the only one who came to Britain at a young age, leading to a very different relationship to her homeland and Britain in comparison with those women who emigrated later in their lives. Meyer became a poet as an adult, writing about a range of topics, yet her work is dominated by the uprooting experience of the kinder transport. Meyer's poetry deals with themes including detachment from her former home, the role of poetry in establishing a sense of belonging, and an attempt at creating a new identity and heimat in Britain. Much of Meyer's poetry, notably written in English instead of her mother tongue of German, suggests an idyllic homeland that has been lost and for which she grieves. However, 50 years later, upon finally returning to this former homeland, which promises safety and attachment, it's clear that this idealized place viewed through nostalgic eyes does not exist, and the high map to which she longs to return is a purely imagined one. Having lived in Britain for 50 years, Maya returns to the childhood home she grieves for and dreams of, and it's evident that her hometown of Karlsbad is no longer a place of safety and comfort. Karlsbad had naturally changed significantly since her childhood, and Maya realizes that the homeland she had preserved in her mind is at odds with the real geographical place. Shortly after visiting Karlsbad, in her poem, The Town, Maya writes, it spat me out, it welcomes me now, cautiously, as a guest who comes and goes again. Placing few, line, few words on each line gives a sense of temporariness, a fleeting visit, a lack of permanency, reflecting this lack of grounding and rootedness and a sense of precariousness in contrast with the sense of home she had expected. Further, it is implied that she feels an alien in the town in which she had expected to feel at home. In Coming Up for Air, Maya reflects on her visit again, writing, often homecoming is not what we have expected. Is this jigsaw my town? Only some of the pieces fit. The disjointed nature of the poem is suggested of not fitting in and being out of place. The disappointment of expectation versus reality is touched upon as the truth of change and development sets in. The realization that she no longer belongs in her former home is a puzzle to Maya, her confusion emphasized by the rhetorical question at the start of the final stanza. The mention of a jigsaw is reminiscent of children's games, again harking back to her youth in Karlsbad and referencing the childhood element inherent in early conceptions of Heimat. Maya's carefully constructed poetry used to describe Karlsbad makes clear that there is still a strong sense of attachment to her former hometown. However, her attachment, rather than to the physical place that her hometown embodies, is instead to the idea of the idyllic homeland and to the nostalgic vision this entails. Unable to liberate herself from the yearning for a home, the actual possession of a heimat is irrelevant. Rather, the sense of hope is what prevails and serves as her irretrievable imaginary concept of heimat. In contrast to the poems of Gerda Meyer, Gabriella Tiergit's writing began in the realm of the factual and non-fiction with her career as a journalist in Weimar Berlin. 
Unafraid to criticize the country's institutions or political parties, Turgut earned a reputation as a potentially dangerous opponent to the increasing power of the Nazi party when reporting on the trial of Adolf Hitler for libel and her arrest was ordered. Turgut was forced to leave Germany and emigrate, first to Czechoslovakia, then Palestine, and finally to London. Turgut was heavily involved in Penn and wrote for the exile press whilst in London. Having been in Britain for a number of years, Turgut's writing presents a feeling of detachment from her country of birth. During the, germ the journey to Germany on her first returning visit in 1948, the country is colored with a sense of foreboding. Man flog damals nicht über den Wolken. Ich sah ein geordnetes Land, Kanäle, Felder, Städte. Das war Holland. Dann kamen dunkle Wälder, fast so symbolisch, Deutschland. The influence of the Nazis in Germany effect, deeply affected Tirgit's relationship to German culture. Having recently discovered and enjoyed English translations of Russian literature, Tirgit wrote to her relative Esther Reifenberg, stating, Den deutschen Mist kann man nicht lesen, ein völlig distörtes Land. In seeing the German landscape, people, and culture as ruined after the horrors of World War II, Turgut's affiliation to her country of birth is suggested to be almost non-existent. It is implied in Turgut's writing that instead of finding a home in a particular place or within a certain country, it's possible to attain a sense of belonging within networks of people, institutions, and communities. She also highlights nomadic elements that render one able to create a home anywhere, for example, in language and literature. In an article for AJR Information, Turgut explains the significance of bookshops for refugees in wartime London. In referring to Bukerfreund, the refugee protagonist of her short story, she writes, Eines Tages entdeckte er Foils. Foils war ein Glück für die Refugees. In diesem alten, so ungeheuer ecken Londoner Haus, Hause entstand kein Antiquariat, kein Buch, Buchhandlung. Es entstand eine Institution, der Londoner Immigration. Bökefreund konnte uns einen großen Teil der Bücher, die in Hitler Deutschland oder anderswo geblieben waren, wieder beschaffen. Bei ihm konnten wir unsere Jugend zurückkaufen. As an institution of London immigration, Foils is suggested as standing for a place of acceptance and familiarity amongst the refugees, where the refugees in London are able to read German language books once again. Here, foils can be seen as a cultural heimat for Turgut and the refugees, existing as both a physical place and a like-minded community, which provides a feeling, a feeling of belonging and security for them. This German-speaking community, though, despite encouraging integration within the group, arguably prohibited integration with the wider world, separating the refugees from the rest of the population. This heimat can thus be seen as grounding the refugees in Britain, yet as preventing them from complete assimilation. In addition to FOILS, other organizations in London equally created the same sense of togetherness amongst the refugees. Turgut refers to Club 43, which is for uns Emigranten dort für eine Weile zum Treffpunkt geworden, another social space providing a sense of safety. A further source of community for Turgut can be found in her work for Penn, Describing her work in a letter to Esther Reifenberg, she commented, Ich bin noch immer die Sekretärin unseres Pennzentrums. Und es ist ebenso, es verbindet mich mit der Welt, es sind meine Freunde. Here, Penn serves as something which connects and even roots Tirgit, not only within the German Penn in Exile community and inwardly, but also outwardly as part of the wider Penn network. Turgut uses her various networks to find a sense of belonging within societal spaces rather than in geography. The multiplicity of them suggesting that an individual should not be tied to a single identity or place. Often these spaces of belonging were transnational ones where both German and English culture could exist alongside each other. Looking back at her early days, Turgut comments, comments Als wir 1937 in England waren, erkannten wir sofort, dass dies unsere geistige Heimat ist, ein humanistisches und liberales Land. 
Describing England as a spiritual heimat implies that it is more about the non-tangible feelings of belonging that provide Tiergate with a sense of home. The third woman writer I researched was Ruth Feiner, who was born in 1909 in Stetten, Germany, and who came to Britain in 1933. She had originally been a songwriter and cabaret artist in Berlin, but her emigration led her to stray from writing for the stage and develop into a writer who largely focused on novels and short stories. Themes of resistance, loyalty, Jewishness, and war dominate Feiner's novels, which are either told from a female perspective or feature a female protagonist. The women in Feiner's novels all struggle with their sense of identity, often caught between multiple countries and nationalities. Feiner's novels thus reflect the ambivalence that many refugees, and perhaps Feiner herself, felt towards their home country and their new nation of refuge. And the question is whether it was possible to belong in either one is discussed. In Feiner's novel, Young Woman of Europe, the idea of Heimat as a place or space of belonging which can change and is not fixed is put forward. Published in 1942, Young Woman of Europe centers on a young girl called Renate Felt, who was writing her life story in 1940 and looking back at her childhood in Berlin. Just before World War II, Renate's father is sent to a concentration camp for a radio address in which he condemned the Nazi practices, and an order is sent out for Renate's own arrest, leading Renate to flee to England. The initials RF, Renate Felt, are notably the same as Ruth's own, Ruth Feiner which may hint at the novel being somewhat autobiographical. In the opening of the book, however, Feiner makes a point of disputing this assumption. When Renata arrives in London, she initially finds it hard to find somewhere to settle. Having finally found somewhere to live, she reflects on her small room in London. I had never known how homely and comfortable the sight of a miserably furnished basement room in Paddington can be when you know it's home to you. There was safety in my little room, security in those odd pieces of old ramshackle furniture. Renata here emphasizes the feelings that her bed at home evokes in her, prioritizing these feelings over the aesthetic experience. In light of Blickler's analysis of the concept of Heimat as a utopian desire for shelteredness and harmony, which highlights the emotional state that a Heimat can create, London, or at least Renata's Paddington bedsit, can be, said, can be considered as a high match of sorts for the girl. It is implied that Renata's perception of home is in line with some of the more modern ideas on the subject. She appears to reject the assumption that one must be born somewhere to call it home, which is the traditional view. Renata admits, I was not born or brought up in England, but I made my home here. I have found sanctuary and shelter in this country. Here, the idea that a heimat can be actively constructive rather than being fixed from birth, as traditionally thought, is discussed. The active role is also implied through the choice of language. Rather than having been given sanctuary and shelter, the use of I made and I found suggests more power and agency on the part of Renata and proves that she still has some ele element of choice in where she belongs. Finally, Eva Priester, a communist activist and adopted Austrian, completes the four writers. Eva Priester, born Eva Feinstein, was born on the 15th of July, 1910, in St. Petersburg, into a Jewish family. As a child, she not only spoke Russian, but also French and German. Aged 11, Eva and her family emigrated to Berlin. And at just 18 years old, she started writing for the newspaper Berliner Tageblatt, like her soon-to-be fellow exile, Gabriela Tiergut. After the Reichstag fire in 1933, Eva joined the Sozialdemokratische Partei Deutschland before joining the Kommunistische Partei Deutschland shortly after. She was briefly imprisoned whilst in Berlin because of her political activities. In 1935, Priester moved to Vienna where she worked as an illegal communist newspaper and became a member of the KPO, the Communist Partei Österreichs, despite not being of Austrian nationality. 
She emigrated to Britain in 1939, where she was heavily involved both in the XR-run Austrian Centre and the communist movement. Although as a writer in exile in Britain, Priester did indeed manage to master English, she wrote mainly in German, which was in fact her second language, Russian being her mother tongue. After World War II, Priester left Britain, choosing to settle in Austria. She became an Austrian citizen in 1948 and remained very involved with the Communist Party. The Austrian Centre in London very much promoted a return home to Austria after the war. Priester reflected on this theme of homecoming in her poem, Abschied und Wiedersehen, which was published in Zeitspiegel in 1943, some years before her return to Austria. Not only does this poem discuss Priester's dream of returning to Austria, it also suggests that to some extent, Austria stayed with her throughout her time in exile. Now, excuse the translations of these, it's quite difficult to uh, translate German poetry, but I thought I'd better give an English version just in case um, we have some non-German speakers. Der Wald ging mit mir durch das Land bis zur Grenze und der Fluss glänzte auf und verließ mich noch nicht. Vor geschlossenem Blick sah ich Fahnen und Grenze, sah ich Bände und Geigen und Straßen in Licht. Denn ich habe im Zug zur Grenze, mein Bruder, vom strahlenden Tag der Heimkehr geträumt. Clearly, the picture of home was still very vivid in Priester's memory, even when she was distanced physically from it whilst in Britain. The forest and river of her homeland mentioned in the poem, however, are only there when the writer closes her eyes. This image of home then is arguably an imaginary one, prone to embellishment and nostalgia, just as conceptions of the Heimat can be. The flags, connoting her political involvement, as well as a national identity, represent belonging and community, an emblem that signifies being part of something bigger that unites people. However, upon returning, the romanticized image of home is not the Austria the priest is faced with, as the final stanza of the poem shows. Der Tag kommt heran, doch der Strom fließt in Schweigen, und die Fahne hängt schwer wie im Blute getränkt, denn die Häuser sind leer und so brochen die Geigen, und das Grab hat die blühende Weisen gedrängt. Ich will schweigend kommen und mir entsandt, meine Gräbe suchen mit tastender Hand und still dein zerrissenes Antlitz verbinden, Land meiner Heimkehr, verblutenes Land. Priester is aware of the idyllic climat illusions believed by many people, and instead positions herself on the side of reality, almost directly contrasting to the opening of the poem. The final stanza shows the broken reality of post-war Austria. In contrast to the earlier dream of the flowing stream, the waving flags, the violins playing in the street, Priester's homecoming is filled with a silent stream, broken violins and blood-soaked flags. These images not only depict the destruction of war, but also the disconnect between Priester's romanticized view of her Heimat and the unpleasant reality as she imagines it. Personified with a face, the land is physically broken and its bleeding is reminiscent of the bloodshed and deaths due to war. Notably, this poem was published in 1943, well before Priester actually returned to Austria. The devastating picture of Poe's for Austria in the poem is thus one that Priester is imagining. However, in projecting how her home will look upon returning, it suggested that Priester is aware of the unrealistic image of home she had previously imagined and therefore preempts her inevitable disappointment upon her Heimkehr. Priester's poem can therefore be read as a warning to other exiles, advising them that they may not return to what they left behind. As can be seen in Meyer and Tiergut's writing, returning home can often be a disappointment. Through the analysis of the writing of Gerda Meyer, Gabriella Tiergut, Ruth Feiner and Abel Priester, it's become clear that the presentations of and attitudes towards home, heimat and belonging in their work are highly complex and ambiguous. All four women present ideas of home and belonging in different ways, but all of them stray from the more traditional conceptions of heimat, suggesting a sense of choice and agency in where they belong. 
In their writing, the four women examined present a view of Heimat and belonging that is far more multi-layered and evolving than traditional definitions and theories of Heimat and belonging allow. In the writing of Gerda Meyer, Gabriella Tiergit, Ruth Fine, and Ava Priester, there is no unified stance on Heimat and belonging, no standard view on home, and no clear-cut fixed answer to the question of how and where they see themselves belonging in the context of exile. Through my research, I hope to enrich not only the field of exile studies, but also add to ongoing discussions and research into artistic responses to belonging and displacement more generally. At a time when the refugee crisis seems to show no sign of abating, alternative ways of understanding exile and displacement are urgently needed. It's also timely to pose the question of how significant the notion of national belonging is in our increasingly transnational world. Thank you very much. I'm glad, thank you very much for that thought provoking and very interesting, especially the last comment of your seminar paper. And I think it's a very profound question. So many refugees still feel like refugees, even when they're very elderly here. Um, Marilyn, I understand that you would like to make a brief comment. Perhaps you would like to do so now before we open the floor uh, to our guests and allow can, them can, to ask questions. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, I just want, I'm the, I'm the daughter of a German refugee, my mother. Um, she was very active um, as an anti-Nazi before 1933. She doesn't fit any of your constructions of Heimat. Um, she arrived here in 33. She, she wrote copiously from then till her death about 15 years ago. Some of her stuff was published. She never wanted to return to Germany. I mean, at all. Um, but she also never felt at home here. So that, you know, <laughs> although she, she became quite well known as a, a writer and, and she wrote about the nature of exile and she was accepted as that, she never felt she belonged. And that's what I want to say. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, that's very interesting. And I think the, the kind of the key finding of my research is that everyone's idea of belonging is different. And you can't put a label on how an exile will feel like they belong or where they feel like they'll belong because it's just different in every circumstance. And in fact, Gabriella Tiergit, um, I mean, I couldn't go into as much detail as I'd, I'd, I'd have wanted, but Gabriella Tiergit did stay in, in Britain, but she never felt like she really belonged in Britain and she didn't feel like she belonged in Germany. And she was kind of caught in between and she called herself a British Berliner. <laughs> um, because she, she felt somewhat tied to Berlin, but not to Germany. Uh, but she also didn't feel like London was her home. And I think that being caught in between, which is also um, a big thing in, in Ruth Finer's writing is, yeah, I think that's probably more prominent than, than we think. May I ask, Ankar, um, to what extent do you think the command of English of various refugees at various times has influenced their sense of Heimat? Um, well, I, I think we can definitely... In this country, if they've, if they've managed to make that transition. I think language is a difficult one. Um, so with Gerda Meyer, because she came at a much younger age, she obviously, you know, she came at 11. She was very proficient in English and actually kind of forgot her German because she did her schooling in English and that definitely contributed to her feelings of being settled in Britain. Mm -hmm. um, but I think also because there was often um, kind of conflicting feelings towards the German language. One, because people associated with the Nazis, but also mm -hmm. 
feeling like the German language is separate to a German identity. And there was all this fantastic literature in German and they felt like the German language was part of them, but there was mixed feelings in speaking it because it was also related to the Nazis. And so I don't know whether kind of attempts to really master English was seen as an attempt to take on that English identity. Um, but I think it would have definitely been easier, you know, given your competence in English to, to settle, but whether that actually imp impacted the way you felt about belonging, I, I don't know. Mm. Plus the fact that so many refugees retained quite a strong foreign accent at times. Yes, yeah, definitely. Which, which immediately made them stand out from fellow British citizens. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to open the floor, so to speak, uh, to other questions. But may I remind you that this seminar is being recorded. So if you don't wish to be shown in the video, um, please go to the icons at the bottom of your screen and stop the video. Ensure that there's a red line going across it before you ask your question. Otherwise, please raise your hand use, using the icon and feel free to ask questions. They'd be most welcome. Yana, we've got a question from Ellen Pillsworth in the chat. Um, mm -hmm. So, yes. She, yep. yes. Um, I'll read it out. That's probably the yeah. best thing. I have a question which I will type because I have a noisy background here, she says. I was curious about the poetry by Gerda Meyer in the 1980s, which struck me as quite a late date. It made me wonder how we define exile writing in terms of period, or do we not do that at all? I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on that. I think that's really tricky. Um, and I had to make a decision at some point um, as to what I included and what I didn't. Um, for example, you know, Gabriella Tirgit did a lot of writing before exile, did a lot of writing after being in exile, but I chose to focus on purely the years she was in Britain because I was concerned with British exile. Gerda Meyer never left Britain and I chose to focus on her poetry, which referred to the impact of exile. Um, and that wasn't uniform across all four women, because as I said, when say Gabriela Tirgit, you know, after war, I chose to just stop after 1945. But as Gerda Meyer was still a child then, I chose to focus on her later writing, which yes. looked back at that. So I'm not sure if we can well, I, I certainly didn't kind of stick to a definition of exile writing in my research, but I'd be interested to know what other people think about that as well. Mm. Do we have any responses, please, to that point? We have two raised hands. We have Andrea and Zach, um, but I don't know if that's in relation, but we can always follow that one up later. Andrea, please go ahead. I'm trying to unmute myself. Uh, I hope that has actually worked. <laughs> yes, yes, we can hear yeah. you. Okay, that's great. Um, well, I haven't got a comment, unfortunately, for that. But I would say, you know, if you, it doesn't really matter. I suppose if you are have, you arrived as a refugee, then whenever you wrote in your lifetime, even if you was later in life, then then that you can still see that as part of exile writing. But um, I, I had a different question, and my question was about. Um, the sort of definition of, of, of identity and Heimat, you know, is it something to do with the fact that, that most of the people of that period had quite, have, have, a, have a definition of sort of identity and Heimat that's quite different from what we have now, you know, now we talk about hybrid identities or third space, I mean, that's certainly sort of concepts I've been playing around, and, and they seem to have quite a sort of essentialist idea of 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 heimat on possibly identity do you think that's 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 important or don't you think that's relevant no definitely um 
And I think they didn't feel that that was a valid um, kind of place on the spectrum to be. Definitely in Ruth Finer's writing, there's, there's this constant talk of being stuck between, and that was a really bad thing. Whereas now we might think, oh, that's, you know, that's being transnational, that's kind of, that's taking bits of different kind of cultures and creating your own hybrid. Um, but I think definitely, yeah, it was seen as you're one or the other and anything else is, is kind of a negative. So I, th I think things have changed. Mm -hmm. We have a comment from Hella uh, Fishman. She says, I think that in the end, you lose the meaning of belonging. I returned to Chile after 15 years in ex of exile in England. And as Eva Priestler noted, returning may be a disappointment. But in my case, I found that political amnesia played a key role. Yeah, I think definitely um, the politics um, on, on all fronts actually impacted the way in which they felt towards places. Um, oh, we've got another comment on hand raising. Um, but yeah, I think that obviously the places have changed themselves, um, but your relationship to them has also changed. And so it's both those things coming into play that then affects maybe the way you feel, or if you feel like you belong there. Um, um, in answer to the message about hand raising, if you go to reactions and click on reactions at the bottom of the screen, you'll see two images of hands, a heart, a smiling face. I think we've got a raised hand from Zach. Zach, please go ahead. Hi, Harry. Um, thanks so much. That was a great talk. Really, really interesting. And it was really nice for me to be able to kind of go back to the little bit of exile studies that I did while I was an undergrad. So fabulous. Thank you. Um, it was just something you said in relation to Hort Feiner, which was that she moved from writing theatre and, and writing plays primarily to writing novels. And I was wondering, one, like, so what was the point really on her journey into exile that that change happened? And also, have you given any, any thought in, in your thesis? So I'd want, I was wondering, you know, what, what your take was on, I suppose, what that aesthetic shift maybe means or reflects or um, kind of... Uh, yeah, I, I suppose I was just kind of wondering what your take on that would be, because it strikes me that it's quite a big change and that might be symptomatic of perhaps her, what was going on in her life. Yeah, so when she was um, in Germany, she wrote for the stage, she wrote songs, and this was all in German. And when she mo moved over to England, she immediately changed to, I think, something that would be more approachable for a mass audience. And she, although her first, I think her first two novels she wrote in German, but only published them initially in translation to English, then went on to only publishing in English. So I think it could be seen as a kind of reaction to trying to be a kind of a mainstream English writer and feel like she was kind of, um, I don't know, but yeah, an English writer rather than a German writer. I think the change in language and the change in genre can almost reflect that change in identity. I'm just checking. Do we have any other questions or comments, please? We have one more raised hand. Um, yes, yes, yeah. Heather, please go ahead. Hi, thanks, uh, Anga, for a fascinating talk. Um, I was really struck by this changing concept of belonging in terms of sort of the individuality and also the fluidity that you've worked out of these four profiles so um, brilliantly. I was wondering whether you came across particularly particular cultural markers 
that were perhaps more shared between them and perhaps less ambivalent than language due to its use, you know, also as a Nazi language, if you like, and um, that being more problematic, but whether there were particular cultural markers that were shared between them. I was also wondering whether they, you have noticed a change over time. So during their years of writing, whether there was a particular or, or um, uh, maybe for one or, or all of them, you know, that you would notice a, a temporality and how their sense of belonging shifted. Um, and, um, and whether there was a difference or you found a difference between the notion of home as in terms of belonging and being at home and how you see that difference. Sorry, those were meant several questions, but that's okay. They are related <laughs> um, so the the cultural markers one. Um, so yeah, language is is complicated. Um, there, I mean, there was a lot of focus, I think, on music um, within kind of the exile organisations. Um, to kind of keep them attached to their their cultural heritage, um, but what what sort of cultural markers were you? Was there any that you kind of thought of? Or uh, yeah, I was thinking about sort of maybe music, liter literature, philosophy. I mean, you mentioned literature, mm -hmm. obviously, with the books in particular, yeah. which was one very prominent one. And I wondered whether there were other ones. You know, yes, like music and maybe. Um, uh, certain foods or ways to celebrate festivals or whatever it was, you know, that yeah. wasn't perhaps so um, contested due to the history? Um, I mean, not, not so much. I know that um, in the Austrian centre, there was a, an Austrian canteen which served kind of Austrian food, but, yeah. you know, their remit was very much to go back to Austria and therefore they wanted to keep Austria alive, which was kind of with the Austrian music performances, the Austrian canteen. Um, but in terms of kind of, I mean, literature again is language, theatre, language. Yeah. It's kind of hard to untangle it all, I think, sometimes. Um, you also asked about time, about how time impacts upon belonging. Um, because I only really focused, uh, with the exception of Gerda Meyer, I only really focused on the war years and yeah, there can't really be seen that much change within that bit. But for example, a bit later after the war, Ruth Finer decided to move to Switzerland. Um, and I can kind of see that as, a, as another between, you know, she didn't want to go back to Germany, but she didn't want to stay in England. And she actually became a translator based in Switzerland as this kind of midpoint. And I think that that sort of changed over time. Gerda Meyer, um, because she came as a child and because I only really looked at her later work, I think she always, she always felt like she wanted to belong in Breton, although she was kind of tied to her, to her childhood home. But Gerda Meyer actually um, stood for UKIP in, I think, 2000, 2010. So she kind of got more and more extreme. She got more and more um, tied to this British identity and not wanting kind of Wanted to, sorry, my cat. <laughs> wanted to sort of protect that, um, which is an odd, an odd thing to do, seeing as you know she herself was kind of um, welcome to Britain, and she wanted to stop that happening for anyone else. So I guess in her case, we can see time as increasing that feeling of belonging in Britain. But for the other ones, because I only looked at small time period, I I couldn't. But I think that'd be a really interesting thing to go on and do. And there was a third part to a question, but I can't remember it. I'm sorry. Um, but that was a question about this. Uh, there's a particular no notion of Heimat that you've depicted so um, brilliantly and um, which doesn't quite translate into English. And there is a distinction, obviously, between Heimat as a sense of belonging, place, location, you know, community. Um, or like spiritual uh, uh, belonging and being at home that you 
you showed this one incident of what it means to be at home, but that can also overlap with a sense of belonging as a place of safety, you know, to, independent of the um, of the of the ramshackle um, you know um, furniture you mentioned. <laughs> so I wondered this 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 difference between at, at home and Heimat, how you sort of saw that within within the um, you know, in the, within those four um, uh, uh, women writers' uh, depiction of of that of that concept, I think the the concept of being at home, uh, as we would say in in English, didn't really feature. I mean, there was that brief um, bit about you know the furniture and things, but really, it it was more about the kind of the sense of of home rather than the place. And I think often the exiles moved around quite a lot as well. And so you couldn't place too much attachment or sentimentality onto a flat because you might move quite quickly. And so I think that almost forces you to find alternative ways of conceptualizing belonging if you know that that physical space is going to change. But I don't think we can translate home art really. Um, home doesn't really do it. Yes. I'm just checking the chat box if there are any more comments there. No. Are there any other comments, please, or questions? We have time for one more. Or is there anything else that you'd like to add, Angad? Um, I don't think so. No, there's been some really good questions so far. So thank you. I think it's it's a very stimulating topic and a very profound one that one could really search the depths of for some considerable time. But you've covered a great deal of ground ad very admirably and in a very stimulating way. So thank you very much indeed. That's been tremendous. I see there's an, something else. I think that's a clapping. That's a thank you. <laughs> yes. That's, yes, indeed. So if there are no more questions, perhaps I'll draw the seminar to a close. But thank you again, most sincerely, Angad, and I wish you all the very best of luck with your ongoing research. And thank you, everyone who's kindly attended. And there are more seminars, but in the autumn, and details will be circulated nearer the time. So it remains to thank our administrator and events manager, Jane Lewin, for, as always, her infinite help. And to wish you a very good evening and a good summer. Thank you.